Okay, so now let's have a look at the uh, second uh, third of the lecture today. Uh, let's look at the next uh, topic. Uh, this next topic corresponds to the next type of components that we find there in this hardware in the loop. And uh, this, uh, uh, these are the uh, DA converters. Before I uh, describe how we can design DA converters, I'd like to make sure that uh, you are aware of all the prerequisites that are needed uh, in order to understand the design of uh, DA converters. These prerequisites include uh, the two uh, Kirchhoff's rule, and I'd like to start uh, with uh, an explanation of uh, Kirchhoff's so-called junction rule. For some of you, that may just be a reminder because you heard this topic already somewhere else. Uh, but I also like to make sure that you uh, understand really how we are going to apply uh, this rule when we apply this for the design of DA converters. Uh, so Kirchhoff's uh, current uh, law reads as follows. At any point in an electrical circuit, the sum of currents flowing towards that point is equal to the sum of currents flowing away from that point. Uh, the reason why uh, this uh, car, uh, car, uh, current law uh, does uh, exist is uh, uh, that there is uh, the conservation of electrical charge and uh, therefore uh, no charges ca can actually disappear there at any of uh, these uh, points. So if uh, uh, we would like uh, to uh, write down this law formally, we can write it down in the following way. The sum of all the currents at any of uh, these points or any of the nodes in the circuit is uh, equal to zero. Uh, where we have uh, to count the uh, currents that are flowing away from the node as negative. So that means in this particular example, uh, we will first of all uh, look at all the currents that are flowing into the node. So we see that there is a total of three. It's I1, I2, and I4. And one current is indicated as flowing away from that node. So we have that on the other side of the equation. And if we uh, use this formulation of uh, the current law, uh, then the sum of all the currents is, is zero, uh, where for uh, I uh, C we have a minus sign there. So that's how we are going to apply uh, the, the, the uh, junction rule. Then furthermore, we need uh, the second uh, uh, rule of uh, Kirchhoff, which is the so-called loop rule. And the loop rule uh, reads as follows. The sum of the potential differences, or the so-called voltages, across all elements around any closed circuit must be zero. So we are considering these uh, closed circuits and are considering uh, potential differences there, or uh, the, the so-called voltages. So that means uh, formally for any loop in the circuit, uh, the uh, sum of all the voltages must be equal to zero, where we are counting voltages uh, traversed against uh, the, the arrow as, as negative. So in this example, let's start with uh, V1. Uh, if we start over here, we are running in this direction, in the direction of the arrow, so therefore it's positive. Here we are running against the direction of the arrow, so therefore it's negative. And over here it's negative again, and over here it's positive again, so there we have a plus sign again. So some of you might wonder whether it's feasible to indicate these arrows in, in any direction that, that we want to. Yeah, indeed, you can indicate these uh, arrows into any direction that you uh, may want to. It could happen that the final result would then be a negative voltage or a positive voltage, depending on which uh, direction you choose. However, you have to be aware of the fact that uh, Ohm's law might uh, look a, a little strange if uh, this uh, current uh, uh, direction and the voltage arrow would be pointing into the same direction, then uh, the uh, uh, law would read as uh, is uh, frequently assumed. However, if uh, these uh, two arrows are running into opposite direction, uh, then there has to be a minus sign there. Okay. So now, hopefully, uh, you have uh, enough knowledge in, in this domain. Next, I need to introduce one component that we are using in the digital to analog uh, conversion, and that's the so-called operational amplifier. Operational amplifiers are uh, supposed uh, to amplify 
uh, fluctuating uh, voltages, so alternating uh, voltages, uh, by a, a certain uh, gain factor. Uh, now we could uh, try to design uh, um, such amplifiers for each and every gain factor that we might want to use in some design, but this becomes very inconvenient because we would need so many different designs uh, for each gain factor we would need a different design. So therefore we try to generalize and we try to generalize in the following way. We are designing operational amplifiers. These are amplifiers that are amplifying the difference between the voltages at the uh, two input terminals by a very large uh, factor. This is called the gain factor. And uh, we try to make that uh, factor as large as possible. Ideally, uh, this gain factor would approach infinity. And then we use additional components to define the actual gain that we need in a particular application. Now this uh, gain factor should approach uh, infinity, however for practical reasons it's not possible to make it really equal to infinity, uh, but it will be very large usually, so usually uh, the gain factor is uh, in, in the order of uh, some, uh, some powers of 10. The characteristic equation of uh, such an op-amp is this one. The characteristic equation uh, defines uh, the voltage that can be observed at the output, and the voltage at the output is the difference between the two voltages at the two input terminals uh, times the gain factor. Another property of uh, these op-amps uh, usually uh, is the fact that uh, these inputs have a very high impedance uh, so that for most practical applications we can assume that there is no current flowing into these inputs. There are only very special cases where we need to take into account the current flowing into the inputs. Now these op-amps are available in various forms. They are integrated uh, in some uh, 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 complex integrated circuits and on the other hand they are also available as custom uh, off-the-shelf components. You can buy op-amps in a package. So for example this is a very much uh, standard op-amp. It's the so-called 741 which exists for uh, decades. It's uh, pretty robust and therefore is used for many applications. So this op-amp will be used in our design of the digital to analog uh, converter and it will be used with a so-called negative feedback. This negative feedback is working against any changes on the uh, inverting input terminal. Uh, with negative feedback we are using one resistor which is connecting the output of the op-amp uh, to this uh, inverting uh, terminal there. And uh, as a result of that, any uh, small uh, voltage peak that uh, happens to exist there at the in, uh, inverting input terminal will be amplified uh, by a very large gain factor, will be inverted, and will be fed back onto the very same input. And therefore, it will be kind of fighting against any small peaks that uh, could uh, exist there at this inverting input terminal. So that means that uh, this uh, feedback, the inverting feedback, will fight against any small voltages that could exist here at this uh, in inverting input terminal. And the question is uh, to what level is this feedback actually decreasing the voltage that we see over here. And I'd like uh, to do a, a, a little bit of math to demonstrate the resulting voltage. So first of all, we consider the characteristic equation of op-amps, uh, specialized for the case where uh, the uh, voltage at the non-inverting input terminal is equal to zero. So therefore, we only have to consider that a part of uh, the characteristic equation. And furthermore, we can apply the loop rule for the loop which is indicated in a blue dotted line over here. So if we move along this loop, uh, we will first of all have a contribution there across this resistor, which is the current times the resistance. Uh, then we have a contribution there from the output voltage at the output terminal. And then we run across this uh, ground line over here. And we know from the previous discussion that the voltage across these two terminals is zero. Uh, so therefore, we can close the loop. <coughs> 
So therefore, we arrive at this equation. Now, uh, due to uh, the first equation, we know that uh, in the second, in the blue equation, we can replace the output voltage there and can replace this by the right-hand side of uh, this equation, uh, which means that we are writing, resulting at the third uh, line over here. Now, the third line can be simplified because we can factor out the voltage at the inverting input terminal there. Uh, so in this way, we have factored out the voltage at the inverting input terminal. And then we can shift this uh, 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 term there in, in parentheses to the other side, and we arrive at this equation for uh, the voltage at the inverting input terminal. Now, on the right-hand side for this equation, we have a certain expression, and we can consider the case where uh, the gain approaches infinity. If for this uh, uh, expression, gain approaches in infinity, we see that uh, the uh, voltage there at this inverting input uh, terminal will approach zero. So therefore, uh, we can approximate the voltage at this inverting input terminal for, for practical purposes there as, as zero. Uh, this uh, input terminal uh, V minus is also called a virtual ground because the voltage is equal to zero. But nevertheless, uh, this should not uh, lead us uh, towards the conclusion that we might as well connect that terminal to ground because then we would change the currents and the whole situation would change. Now, this is what we use in our design of uh, digital to analog converters. In our design of digital to analog converters, we will first of all uh, try to generate a current which is uh, proportional to the number represented uh, by a bit vector in our computer. The bit vector in our computer is supposed uh, to drive uh, uh, switches that are turning on and off certain currents over here. So we assume for the sake of simplicity that we are working with a natural number encoded into four bits and that these uh, four uh, bits are driving these four switches over here. If the bit is one, the switch is closed. If the bit is zero, the switch is open. And then we have uh, resistors uh, that allow us to generate a current uh, which reflects uh, the, the weight of a particular uh, bit in our digital representation. So if we have the least significant bit, for example, this resistor is, has a larger value uh, because uh, the resulting current should be rather small. And uh, if we are looking at the most significant bit there, the resistance should be smaller because this will result in uh, the largest current. So that means these different uh, resistors, uh, they uh, in increase uh, by uh, 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 a, a factor that is a power of two. So uh, this is how uh, we design the circuit. And next, I'd like to demonstrate that with this circuit, we can actually generate a current which is proportional to the number which is encoded in uh, the uh, bit vector. Uh, I do this by first of all looking at uh, this loop that is indicated with uh, dashed lines down here. And we can look at uh, the different voltages there along this uh, loop. First of all, we will have a certain contribution there for uh, this uh, resistor provided that there is a current. And the current exists only in case that this switch is actually closed. If the switch is closed, we will have a certain current I0 and uh, the voltage across that uh, resistor is uh, uh, the current times the resistance, which is uh, eight times the, uh, the basic uh, resistance that we're using for that resistor up there. And then uh, we are proceeding in the direction of this arrow uh, further along this loop. Uh, this is all a ground level. And over here, we are traversing this arrow in uh, the uh, direction against uh, that uh, uh, direction of the arrow. So therefore, it's uh, the negative uh, reference voltage there. Uh, this equation uh, can be rewritten so that we have this uh, current on the left-hand side and all the other terms there on, on the right-hand side. Now, that was a special case of uh, that uh, uh, least significant bit. We can also look at uh, the corresponding equations there for, for the other bits. Uh, 
And for the other bits, the only thing uh, which uh, changes is the power of 2 that needs to be considered. Uh, 2 to uh, 3 minus i is the expression uh, which reflects the different factors that we see over there. So then next we can consider uh, the junction rule at uh, this particular junction over there. Uh, and according to the junction rule, the current flowing out of that node is the sum of all the currents that are flowing into the node. And this can again be uh, rewritten by now inserting uh, the four different equations from above here. So that overall we find that the current corresponds to these uh, four different terms. And this can be simplified by uh, 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 using a, a, a uh, formulation where we have two factors. Uh, the rightmost factor corresponds uh, to uh, the conversion of a, a bit vector uh, towards the uh, number which is represented. And uh, this uh, first uh, coefficient is actually a constant coefficient uh, that uh, is, is just uh, providing a, a certain uh, constant for uh, this uh, uh, propor proportional behavior. So we might come, or we can come to the conclusion uh, that uh, obviously uh, the current uh, is proportional to uh, the value uh, that is encoded in that uh, digital uh, bit vector if that uh, bit vector is interpreted uh, as uh, uh, encoding a natural number, so any uh, positive uh, uh, natural number. Okay, so uh, well, in, uh, conversion into a current uh, is useful, but it is in a way inconvenient because uh, current outputs are inconvenient to work with. Obviously, if you don't connect anything to a current output, there cannot be any current flowing out of that output, so there are certain limitations with respect to the use of current outputs anyway, and there are also other reasons why current outputs are less uh, popular. There are only very restricted uses of current outputs. It's more convenient to use a voltage output, and that's what the uh, operational amplifier is used for. Uh, the purpose of using the operational amplifier is to turn uh, the current into a proportional voltage. And uh, the operation of this uh, operational amplifier can be explained as follows. Uh, first of all, we look at the loop rule for the loop involving this resistor up here and uh, involving also the, the output uh, voltage there. For this loop rule, we have a contribution there from the voltage across this uh, resistor, which is R1 uh, one times uh, the current, which is I prime. And then we have uh, this voltage, which is called Y. Uh, this is all connected to, to ground. And then we are uh, completing this loop uh, by also uh, uh, walking along uh, this, uh, 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 this arrow over here, but we already know that the voltage between these two terminals is zero. So therefore, uh, this is the result of considering uh, the loop rule. Furthermore, we can look at the junction rule for that particular junction. And since we know that the input current into that operational amplifier is zero, we know that I equals I prime. So therefore, in this equation up there, we can insert uh, I. And then from the previous slide, we know this uh, expression for I. And we can insert this value of I into that uh, equation up there. And we can uh, rephrase that equation so that we have uh, just Y on one side of the equation. So if we rephrase the equation in that way, we have uh, Y, uh, which equals a, a certain expression consisting of some constant terms. So these first terms are uh, overall constant terms. And then on top of that, we have uh, the uh, right part of uh, that right-hand side. Uh, which corresponds to the conversion from uh, the digital bit vector to the represented number. So again, we have this situation where the output value is uh, proportional to 
the number which is represented by that uh, bit vector. We have a minus sign there, uh, which may be boring in certain cases, but in general we have to make the circuit a little more complicated anyway, uh, because for many applications we would like uh, to have a conversion for uh, integer numbers. That means we might uh, be interested to have a conversion also uh, for encoded negative uh, numbers, and for this purpose we might have to modify uh, the converter anyhow. So that uh, concluded the presentation of the conversion back to the analog domain. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we have achieved uh, uh, the uh, generation of a certain waveform which is shown in, in this chart. Uh, so you see here the step-like function that we can observe at the output of uh, this uh, converter back to the uh, analog domain, provided that we assume that between these conversions we are just keeping the value constant. This is what we also call a uh, zero-order hold. That means whenever there is no new value arriving from the input, uh, we just keep the old uh, value of the output there available at the output of the DA converter. This is actually what is happening for our design of the DA converter because as long as no new number is actually applied to these switches, the old value will just remain the same. Uh, so therefore, in between these uh, uh, different samples, uh, the uh, voltage at the output will remain the same, and this is what we call zero-order hold. Uh, in this uh, chart, I have uh, compared uh, the resulting output to the input that we initially had uh, before the anti-aliasing circuit, and uh, I did already raise a question in uh, the very first uh, lecture corresponding to this chapter whether or not it would be possible uh, to reconstruct the original input uh, signal from uh, the digital uh, value. That would, of course, be very nice because, for example, we would like uh, to use uh, this digital representation for music, and it would be nice if we had a recording of some very nice uh, music, if uh, that uh, recording, if played from a CD, uh, would in one way or the other sound rather natural. Now, I can assure you that uh, this waveform would not sound very natural. Uh, because there are very high frequency components. You can think of trying to approximate this step function uh, with uh, sine waves, and this approximation would require uh, sine functions of very high frequency, so you would have very high tones here, which do not exist in the original input signal. Uh, so therefore, uh, this way of uh, reconstructing uh, the uh, original input signal doesn't quite work. Uh, we have to think about uh, some more complicated, some, some more sophisticated uh, ways of uh, reconstructing uh, the input uh, signal. One way would, of course, be to assume that we are increasing the sampling rate, that we work with very high sampling rates, uh, which could mean that for audio we are not working in the kilohertz range, but maybe in the megahertz range, but that of course would be uh, very inconvenient and very inefficient. We would need a huge amount of data on the CDs and that doesn't work, really work. However, there could be the question, would there possibly be some smart way of interpolating between the sampling points. If between all these sampling points we would possibly be able to in interpolate in a smart way, then we would possibly be able to regenerate the original uh, uh, signal in a meaningful way. Uh, 